Good morning. This is March 6th, the year 2000, here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And this morning we're pleased to have with us Leo Dorrington. Leo, how are you today? Fine, thank you. And we're very glad to have you with us. Uh, do you mind if I begin by asking you your age? I'm 50. I just turned 50. Just turned 50. In another 50 years, you'll be 100. <laughs> please, please, I should live so long. <laughs> yeah. What is your address? In Somerville. Somerville, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And uh, current matter, marital status? I'm still, I'm married. Okay. Do you have children? I have four children. The oldest is 24. The youngest is 10 years old. Uh, I guess I should ask you if you have grandchildren, if you have Not a yet. child at 24. Please. Not yet. Okay. Where were you born, Leo? I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And raised? In Arlington, Massachusetts. Okay, so most of your life and residence have been across the Charles River, is that correct? Well, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, what was that community like when you first got there? That was uh, some time ago, I gather. In Arlington? Yeah. It was your typical streetcar suburb. It had, actually, really did have streetcars back in those days, and I can mm -hmm. still remember them. Um, it's any other suburb. Uh, the people basically lived and worked in Boston. My father worked in Allenton. He was a member of the fire department, from which he's now retired. And basically, I lived there until I, uh, after I got married. I spent my first married, first six years of my married life there. And then we moved to some of them. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about your family. Your dad worked for the fire department. Yeah. What about your mother? We had a relatively, well, middle-sized family. We had, there were six of us, six children. My parents were born and raised in Allenton, in both of them. Um, my mother was first generation Irish. Both her parents were from Ireland. My father's family was also Irish, but they had been over here since the 1850s. <clears throat> my great-great-grandfather, fought at Gettysburg and his son became a tanner and founded a leather company in Woburn which no longer exists. It was a Darrington leather company and um, my grandfather married my grandmother who was born and raised in Allenton and that's how we, they happened to come to Allenton. There were six children, I was the middle Three boys, three girls. I was the youngest boy. And the three girls come after me. So at least uh, on your father's side, you've got some pretty deep Yankee roots. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anybody yeah. who had served at Gettysburg goes back a long yeah, way. Yeah. He was in the um, Company E, 9th Massachusetts Regiment, which was an all-volunteer Irish regiment. Of course, I don't know how. A lot of them, basically, for them, it was volunteering just to get the money. I don't think very many of them had. You know, a few of them probably did, but most of them probably weren't that much in this country that they had such patriotic roots that they would, you know, be so totally committed to the cause. Well, those were the days where right. they paid bounties and right. it was most acceptable. When and where did uh, you enter the military? I joined in October of 1969. Um, it was, I was right out of high school. Um, what I did was my two brothers had gone in the military, one had gone in the Marines and one had gone in the Army. And I figured, well, it was my turn to go. So I chose the Army because I figured, well, I didn't want to join the Marines. So I went away in October of 1969. It took me six months to get out of basic. I had gotten sick a number of times. But I finally graduated from basic in April of 70. And I ended up serving two years at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I served there until April of 72 when I got a uh, early release. They were doing the, at that time they were trying to do away with the, um, they were trying to go on the all-volunteer army, so they were offering six-month early releases. You said a moment ago that it was, uh, you felt it was your turn. Why in your family did people take a turn to join the military? Well, at that time, the, it, it, it seemed that normal for the sons to go in the military. My father and all his brothers had been in the military during World War II and Korea. And we felt it was our patriotic duty to do that. You know, it was the right thing to do. For historical purposes, 
What was going on in the United States of America in 1969? Uh, that was during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. During rather the crazy, hectic days when the, uh, the anti-war demonstrations, the hippies, the um, college uh, the riots and things. Yeah. Did you join up specifically to go to Vietnam? Well, I figured if I had been sent to Vietnam, I wouldn't not go. I just figured if I went, I'd go. If not, well, that was, that was, the, you know, if it was meant to be, it was. If it wasn't, it wasn't. Okay. For um, no particular reason, why didn't you want to go into the Marine Corps? Well, it's funny. A year before I joined, my brother had gone through Marine, Marine Basic, and my mother and I flew down to attend his graduation. And I, I got to spend three days on the base, and I discovered that it was a rather hectic and rigorous training that they go through. At Paris Island? Yeah. And I figured, well, it would probably be, I didn't really didn't want to go through that. You know, I, I sort of got an insight into the differences between the Army and the Marine basic. Essentially, the Marines try to make you all automatons, all the same. In the Army, they taught you how to think through a military problem. You know, it's, it's funny, the, the Army was so, it sort of teaches you to take a hill through logic and through um, a good marshalling of your resources. With the Marines, you're taught to take the hill, even if it, you know, just charge right up there, even if, even if it means losing your life and 50 million others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that explains why you were in the army. Right. Uh, you talked. You said you were. You got us up to the year 1972, and you were at Fort Knox. Right. I did two years at Fort Knox. I and was, they uh, offered you early uh, release from the military. Right. Did you take that? Yes, I did. So you were out in '72, but I know you went back in. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, basically, okay. at that time, when you joined up, you did a six-year stint. If you did a three-year active duty, you also had to do a three-year inactive duty. And that was if you did it in a reserve unit or just you know, on, on a situation where you would be called up for two weeks active duty mm -hmm. during the summer. Um, at that time, I figured, well, I wanted to stay in somewhat. So a month later, um, I joined a reserve unit, the 803rd. Yes. Um, I That's did, a, a medical group? Right. Yeah. I did that because I figured, well, if I had to do two weeks in the summertime, it would probably be better for me to do it with people I knew. Plus, also, the, the money benefits would have been fine. Okay. You know, I figured I, I liked the military enough that I didn't want it to be my life, but I didn't want to lose it totally. Okay, let's go back a minute. When you went into the service, uh, did friends or family join when you did, or did you go in by yourself? Oh, I went by myself. Yeah, and, wh and where were you sent for basic training? Fort Dix. Fort Dix. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, let's see. I went away in um, October of 69, and, well, the first three months, basically, I was in and out of the hospital. It wasn't until February or March of 70 that I actually finished the train, got through the training. It was the basic, it, it, basic at that time was an eight-week thing, where the first two weeks was primarily uh, drill and ceremonies, you learn the history, um, the reasons, the, the psychological reasons why you do things. The third and fourth week was tr primarily rifle training and grenade training. The fifth, sixth at weeks were a lot more in-depth, hands-on training. Um, charging up hills, doing the confidence course, uh, learning assaulting hills and stuff like that. The seventh week was primarily the uh, testing to make sure you knew all that. The eighth week was more of the same and then came graduation. You have pretty good memory of what happened to you uh, some 25 years ago. Did you write all this down or have you written a memoir? Uh, no, but it's, I probably should. I've, I've got a lot of letters that I've written home that you know, at that time, the, the girl who became my wife, um, I was seeing her at that time, and I still have all the letters. She kept them all. She kept them all. Well, that's that's for a year. And I, I, in the seventies and eighties, <clears throat> I went back over and reread some of them. What happened to you after you left Fort Dix? Okay, after Fort Dix, 
It's interesting. Usually most people go to, um, after basic, they go to a thing called AIT, which is more advanced in-depth training, depending on what they're going to do. Um, when I joined, I was to be in the per, per, uh, personnel division. I was going to be a clerk. Um, well, I, I didn't actually do it in a um, formal setting. It was, they kept me on after I graduated from basic. They kept me on the same unit as a, um, like in a hands-on type thing. And I did the same, the work. And then two months after graduation, they sent me to Fort Knox. And it just so happened that the unit that does the in-processing needed a quirk typist. So they, they, they snatched me right up. And I've stayed with them for two years. What was your specialty during military duty? My specialty was um, quirk typist, uh, personnel records. Um, I particularly um, did the work in the department where if someone had lost their records or if the records were lost somehow, I would have to reconstitute the records. You know, do a lot of in-depth research as to why, you know, try to piece them back together. Did that happen often? Yes. Well, not often, but there, was, there were a number of cases where it happened. Can you give us an example of this having? Um, I'm trying to remember this, this situation where someone lost it like in a fire or some disaster. It was a plane crash or something or, or a fire or something. Usually that was, that's what would happen. People would just, you know, the records would be lost in the mail mm -hmm. or they'd be lost in fires or stuff. I think this one guy lost it like in a plane crash or something. His records just happened to, be, to have been lost. So for future use, it was up to you to reconstruct? Oh, yeah. It taught me a valuable lesson because from that time on, I made a point to keep copies of everything I had. Mm -hmm. um, if I had brought that file, I had a file of a stack of papers this big. What did you like or dislike about the work you did? It was tedious for one thing, but it was rather interesting because you could, the investigative work part of it was, was fun to do. You know, trying to, to uh, pursue leads to try and, and, and piece things together. But then if, you, if I wasn't doing that, if I was just doing tedious clerk job, that, was, that ended up being tedious. So the investigative part uh, right. kept you interested in what you were doing. As you advanced in the, your military time and career, <clears throat> did the Army or the military prepare you for the cultural differences you might be facing in the future? For example, if you were sent to China, did they prepare you for this or eventualities in your career? They did themselves. What happened was when I was in school, in grammar school, I developed a propensity for um, history, geography, social studies, that I went out and learned on my own about other cultures. Um, it helped me immensely when I found to go to Saudi Arabia because I was so well versed in the culture. And it's interesting because at that time I was trying to learn a lot more, you know, like in the 70s, I was trying to learn a lot more about uh, Vietnam, about Russia. I particularly wanted to know, you know, I, I don't remember who it was that said that, but one famous person said that you needed to you know, know thine enemy. And I felt, well, you really needed to know about them, you know, in order to know how they ticked. You know, my wife always asked me, she said, why are you always reading books about Russia and, and those countries if we're taught to hate them? I said, well, you have to know them in order to, you have to know why you hate them. You have to know how to defeat them. Were you dealing with people at this time who had served at Vietnam? No. My only reference point to someone having, to serve, having served in Vietnam was my own brother. My brother, who had joined the Marines, ended up serving a year in, in Vietnam. And, and it was while I was in basic that he was over there. He got to Vietnam just after Tet. And he served a year there, uh, 60, uh, late 68 to late 69. Actually, it was more like winter of 69 to winter of 70. Or what was it, winter of 70 to 71? The Tet Offensive. Well, it was, he yeah. got there like six months after Tet. Yeah. And he served a year there. It was more like 13 months. OK. Um, I've got you at Fort Knox, is that correct? No, right. OK. And at what point did, did your early release come? It came in April of 72. 
I was due to get out in um, October, but I opted to get out in April. And you decided you would join a reserve unit, is that correct? Right, right. And you went into the uh, 803rd Medical Group in right. 1972. Right. Tell us about that group and why you chose that or okay. how it was chosen for you. Well, they were located in Boston at the time, at the old Army base, which is now the, the garment building, the one white building there in, on the waterfront. Um, I got a phone call one day from a Sergeant Major Connolly. He, I guess they, the units got a list of people who had come out, and he know, knew that I was a, um, had been a personnel specialist by the time I got out of Fort Knox, and they had a slot for someone like that. And he asked me to come down, and I walked, walked the unit over, and I, and I ended up, I joined them. I decided to join them. Now this would be on a part-time basis, is that correct? Oh, you know, a reserve basis. You just went, you did your one weekend a month. Yeah, and, two and weeks. subject to recall. Right. That's correct? Right. And, okay, t describe the kind of work you did there. It was basically a continuation of what I had done at Fort mm -hmm. Knox, minus the uh, investigatory work. Um, I worked in a, I was a personnel specialist, did the personnel work for the unit. I was one of several others. Um, over the course of five years, I ended up becoming the chief of, the, of, the, of that department. I became the personnel sergeant for the unit. You were a sergeant at this time? Uh, okay. Yes. This is a, a characterized as a medical group. Um, tell us about the work the group itself did, okay. aside from your job. Right. Basically, the job of the medical group was, <clears throat> it's it summed up in two words, command and control. We were the command and control unit that did that. You know, it, it, there was quite a number of other units under us, um, general hospitals, uh, medical, I'm trying to think of names, um, medical querying companies, um, uh, field hospitals, that we would um, decide where to place them, and they would, um, it's sort of like a two-tiered thing, it's command and control. We would command and control them. They would, if they needed anything, they would have to go through us. Uh, if they needed replacements, if they needed logistics, they would have to go through us. We also um, command and we also had to interface with our next higher headquarters in much the same manner. It was like a continuous step ladder from the top to the bottom. We were like halfway down. Okay, what sort of work did they do as uh, as a medical group? What they were doing was, um, if there was a wartime situation, they would be one of several that would 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 take charge of certain sectors okay. and with certain units that they would have to, you know, um, keep, as, as the, the front would change, they would be, they would have to move the units, the medical units, to, to maintain a continuous mm -hmm. flow for the patients. I have a, a mental image of a MASH unit. Is, are we in the same ballpark? Right. Um, we didn't actually have MASH units under us, but it would be, if you were going to take the MASH scenario, they would be one of the units that were, were under us. And mm -hmm. we would have to um, move them to coincide with the, the, the pace of the battle. And if they needed replacements, or if they needed to move their patients around, it, we would get involved with that. So you were the people Henry Potter was always calling up right. in the... Asking where the stuff is, is right, that right? Right, right. We would okay. have been that group. I got it, I got it, okay. Were you sent, uh, were you an individual uh, when you joined this unit or were other people that you knew from previous experiences uh, sent to this unit with you? No, it was just an individual basis. Okay. And let's see, you're, you're serving at Fort Knox? No, you're in Boston now. Right. Okay. Back home and... Did your duties change at any time throughout your military career? Do you mean the duties like with the, the, the 803rd? Yeah. Well, yeah, about maybe six, seven years after I joined the unit, um, I left the um, personnel department. I basically had an argument with, with, with my top boss over um, 
rules and procedures how to do things. I still to this day maintain that I was right. Um, they wanted to kick me out, but I figured, no, I want to stay in. So they offered me a position doing preventive medicine work, which was another department in that uh, unit. So I, I opted for that. I took a, a, a step down in rank, and I went into the preventive medicine department which was part of the operations section. You were now a corporal, is that correct? Well, um, at the time I took this, it was, it was an E7, I, I, I was an E7 sergeant first class, dropped down to staff sergeant, which was E6. Um, in 1980-81, I got into the um, preventive medicine field. My notes show that uh, you were an NCO dealing with safe water and environment mm. and things like that. Right, that's what the preventive tell medicine Tell us about was. that. Well, actually it turned out you know, this, this little argument turned out to be a, a big milestone in my career. Um, as I said, working in personnel can get awfully tedious. And I work back on those days now, and, and I, I feel, gee, you know, it was, like, it was almost like a dead-end type job. You know, you can only go so far. But once I moved to the preventive medicine department, um, it took me a couple of years. I went to school. I did OJT. I got the... Explain that, please. I'm sorry, um, I performed the job for a number of years. In the meantime, I took correspondence courses. I went to the medical um, academy at Fort Sam, the Army uh, Academy of Health Sciences, formally got the designation, you know, formally became accredited as a preventive medicine NCO, um, got my E7 back, and became the 803rd of. Um, formal preventive medicine NCO. You know, at that time it was like an acting type job. Um, OJT means on the job training. I was learning that while I was doing the correspondence courses. Uh, by the mid 80s I was, you know, the official, you know, uh, preventive medicine NCO with the, with, the tit with the title and with the rank. What sort of work specifically, give us a good example if you would, uh, uh, of dealing with safe water or making sure the troops had safe water and, and your interface with the environment. Okay, basically what it was is once we set up in a, our camp, or if, if they set up their camp, my job was to go out there, inspect, um, you know, do testing of the water, maintain, make sure it was safe, and if it wasn't, to um, offer them advice and guidance on how to, to do that. Plus I had to do that in my own unit. Um, I would also <clears throat> make sure that the, the garbage or rubbish that they generated was taken care of properly. There are certain rules and regulations about what you can do um, here or what you can do overseas. Um, a lot of the units that we had, a lot of the hospital units, had kitchen facilities. We had to inspect those. Uh, we, <clears throat> we had to make sure that, for example, um, units with hospitals, had, they, they had to maintain separate facilities for their uh, patients and for their, uh, their working staff. So that if there was ever any dis disease outbreaks, it wouldn't, wouldn't overflow into the, uh, the workers. And I had to make sure that they, they maintained separate um, latrine facilities for, for each group. A latrine being the field form of a bathroom. How, how far afield did you go to perform this kind of work? Where did you go to? Well, we did it for at Fort Devons. Yeah. Uh, we also had training exercises down at Camp Edwards. Uh, we had times where we would go to Fort Bragg or um, Fort Meade, different posts in the eastern part of the country. The 803rd was, was a reserve, um, I'm trying to think how I can explain this. In the military alignment, a reserve unit is, is aligned or uh, affiliated with a active duty medical group or medical brigade in this case. In our case, we were aligned with the 44th Medical Brigade, which, is, which was the medical arm of the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg. So there were a number of times that we actually went to Fort Bragg and did two weeks, like a two week operation. They would oversee how we would run things, you know, just to make sure that we were doing it right. There were also a number of years that we did the same thing at, um, well, then Camp Drum, now it's Fort Drum in upstate New York. 
it got to the point where we knew a lot of people from the 44th. And by the late 80s, they were inviting a number of us in my unit to participate in, in a number of their operations. In 1986, I got to go to um, the, the desert in California to help them on, a, um, on their Gallon Eagle, which is a joint operation that they do with the 102nd, with the 101st. Airborne? Airborne, yeah. yeah. They, they do war games. The, it's it's the, basically the 82nd versus the, one, the 101st. And they do this like every two or three years. And um, the 44th needed people to, to, to fill in some of the slots. So they invited myself and four others to come along. So essentially I worked as the um, assistant preventive medicine NCO for the uh, 44th. I get the impression you did quite a bit of traveling. Uh, yes, I did. I did a lot more traveling in the reserves than I did in the active duty. Yes, I can see that you did. Um, what did you think of working with the 82nd and the 101st? Those are tough units. Yes, um, I thought it was rather interesting. And, and it gave me a good feel for, you know, like um, trying to see the bigger picture, you know, the, the, um, what, what the 82nd does. And, you know, I was basically involved with the medical aspect of it. You were with the uh, 803rd Medical Group until 1993. Right. Uh, Vietnam was over. Um, what was going on in the United States of America at that time? What, were, uh, what was the military doing? Okay, at that time, during the um, Carter years, the um, military started downsizing um, to the point where it was felt that it wasn't going to be able to do its job. So once President Reagan came in in the early 80s, the money started coming in, the operations started to get, there, were more, there was more money for, for things, for um, uh, training, for um, operations, you know, there was more opportunity to do things. How much time had you had in the military about now? By that, by that time I had almost 15 years. 15 years? Oh, well, I'm, I'm trying to, it was just over 10 years. And what was your rank? Um, at that time it was, um, well, the, it, it was, for a while it was E7, then it was E6 again, and I dropped, then I went back up to E7 mm -hmm. in the mid. Let me, let me ask you a kind of an umbrella question here. Uh, you had a good career, you learned interesting things because of your own interest in it. Um, you feel your officers gave you good leadership and incentive to uh, do all the studying you did and get pr the promotions you did? Did you have good leadership? Um, yes, we, they, were, they were good leaders, but there were also people who were not good leaders. I was fortunate in having, having some leaders, some uh, higher NCOs and some officers who helped me along, who who gave me the incentive, plus I also had my own self-incentive to, um, to prove that I could do it. There was always, you know, through my career, there was always this feeling that I needed to prove myself. To yourself or, right. or to your family or to well, your to brothers? To myself, and, basically. And do you feel you did that? You I think so, yeah. yourself I, I, well? I believe I did, yes. Okay. Did you network through the Army? Uh, you met guys and they came and went in your life. Right, right. Did you stay in touch with them? Yes. And were they at any time useful to you oh, or yeah. vice versa? It, became, it, it, it came to the point where there was, there was a, a little core nucleus of people in the 803rd that um, we, um, we, we're still together. We, we see each other socially. You know, we always have a Christmas party. Do you party. really? Yeah. Um, there was about a group of about 10 of us that, that stayed together um, and, and, be, and formed a good group. Uh, and a lot of us were still there in the, you know, went to Saudi together in, in uh, 1990. You know, people would come and go and, and, you know, they would always, there'd always be a few that would assimilate into this little group. You know, we, we formed a good working relationship. Am I correct? Is the word Honduras on your um, resume? Right. Um, in 1988, um, I got a chance to go to Honduras for three weeks. There was a road building operation that um, I had heard about, and they needed preventive medicine personnel. So um, I got 
put on the list, and I went for a, a, a two-week training course in the summer of 87. With, what they did was they, they took us down to um, Fort Hill in Virginia, out in the boonies, because they, they wanted to see how people would operate in a um, remote situation, because that's how, how it would be in Honduras. <clears throat> they wanted to see if people could, could relate to that and if there was going to be any problems. And, you know, most of us made out all right. And then six months later, we were in Honduras for three weeks, helping to run the hospital. I was doing the preventive medicine work. Were it, you were at Tegucigalpa, or where were you? Um, it was uh, uh, just outside the village of uh, Puente Grande, which is in the north central part of the country, in the mountains. Now here's a local boy down in uh, Honduras. Tell us about your feelings about going down there and what you did specifically. Okay, just want to take some water first. Have a drink of water. Okay, yeah, that's my throat. There's more in there in the picture okay. if you like it. This is, this sounds like a, an assignment um, much like you've had before, but in a totally different locale. Oh yeah, it was much better. I, uh, it, it was rather interesting. Again, um, I had read a lot uh, about Central America, the politics, the, the, the cultural, the, um, the social, economic type things. The interesting thing about about Honduras was it's the the second poorest country in the in this hemisphere. Only Haiti was was poorer. And it was interesting because we were in the in the rural mountains. There was a village outside. It was Puente Grande. We had set set up our base camp there, including the hospital that we used to treat the um, engineers that were doing the road. <clears throat> we also set up a, a situation where we would treat the locals. You know, the local villagers could come to us for medical aid. And then twice a week we would go into a distant region and set up a, a one-day medical aid station, you know, to treat people, you know, give them just basic uh, one-time only treatment. Um, we all, would also help them with their dental problems, which for them was mostly just pulling their ache and teeth. Mm -hmm. um, it was rather, it was very interesting because you know I got to see, you know, part of the world I probably would never have been going down to. What what year was this? This was 1988. 88. Right. Uh, were were there any American operations going on in Nicaragua at that time? There was. Um, well, I knew about the Contras and stuff. Specifically yeah. of Ollie North and the Contras. Right. We had been told that we couldn't go anywhere, um, we couldn't go anywhere uh, 25, within 25 miles of any of the other borders, Nicaragua, El Salvador, mm -hmm. Guatemala, which was, uh, which I didn't particularly care for because I had wanted to visit Copan, which is just across the border in Guatemala. Um, so I didn't get a chance to see the Mayan ruins that I would have liked to. But it was, it was interesting just being down there and seeing how the local people lived. And it was interesting because they, there was a sugar cane field and I got to eat raw sugar. And um, you know, every morning you could hear like the cocks crowing over in the village, you know. And, and essentially those people, they kept their animals right there with them. Can you tell us uh, as a representative of the United States Army, uh, how were you received by the people? Uh, you, you say you gave them medical attention. Did they understand your being there for any particular reason? I think they, they understood that we were trying to better their lives by building... Uh, what we were doing was, build, was building the roads through the mountains so that they could, the farmers could get their, their crops down to the, the villages, you know, down the, the valleys and stuff. For the most part, they seemed like they, they want, that they were happy that we were there. It was interesting, you know, in the bus trip up from Tegucigalpa, every time you made a stop, there was always 50 million kids running around um, asking for chocolate, chocolate. And, um, <laughs> you know, there was always people trying to sell us stuff. I have here in my notes that uh, 
you acquired a detailed knowledge of the area of your assignment, uh, the life and customs. Um, and we might have touched on this before, but it sounds like the Army prepared you very well for what you were doing. Is that true? I, I think what it was is it, it, it was a, a takeoff from my earlier interest in social studies. I've always had an inquisitive, um, I've always been inquisitive about what life is like in other countries and for other people. And the Army, especially once I started traveling, made me want to learn more because I felt it was best to know so we could deal with this, with, mm -hmm. with any, any situation, especially with the preventive medicine. You know, I wanted to know particularly what, what, what the situation was in, in, in any given country so we could deal with it. Had your books prepared you? Is, was it what, as you expected? Pretty much, yeah. Was yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I would try to get my knowledge from, from other sources, too. Um, like, for example, the, for example, the Lonely Planet series of books always had a very good section on uh, local health hazards and, and you know, things like that. Would you bring us up to date on, uh, this is 1988, if I got it correctly, in Honduras. Um, and I know we're working towards Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, you came home from Honduras and went back into your line of work here in the, right, the local right. area. Um, did you see any war clouds gathering to suggest to you that you were be going to send to the Middle East? At that time, no. Um, during the 80s, we kept up very much with the Iran-Iraq war. Um, essentially, most of us felt that we we seemed to side with, with Iraq more because of what had happened with the hostages and, and the way the government mm -hmm. was in Iran. It seemed like our natural tendency would be to support the Iraqi side because we really didn't want the Ayatollah and the, the present regime in Iran to, to gain the upper hand. And um, in the late 80s, it, it, I began to study more about the situation in the Middle East, and I learned a lot about the, um, the historical uh, antipathy between the uh, Arabs and the Persians, and the, the, the unending conquest back and forth, you know, the Persians overrunning the territory, and then the, uh, the Arab, uh, the Islamic uh, takeover of the whole area. You know, it was, it was it's like a, it's been a back and forth thing you know the um, I also learned a lot about how the people over there felt the um, the local Arabs always felt that to them Iraq was a um, a natural barrier between the the Persians you know to, to keep the Persians from conquering and overrunning the, the rest of the Middle East and that remains today I feel that's one of the reasons why we, we haven't been able to to finish him off or contain him, even after the war, much to the way we, I think we wish we should have done. You've mentioned uh, Presidents Carter and Reagan, and we're working our way up to Bush. Um, shall we get to Bush and talk about your going to Saudi Arabia? Okay. Um, ironically, it always seemed that each military operation I did seemed to build towards Saudi Arabia. Um, going to Gallon Eagle in the, in the desert, and then going to two years later to Honduras, it was it was almost like a natural stepping stone to the ultimate experience in Saudi Arabia. Some of the members of my unit who who were in the know um, had an idea that we would be going over there in early August when uh, Iraq first invaded Kuwait. There had been an operation that some of them had been involved with in Nashville just a few months before that touched on just the same scenario. And predicated on the invasion of Kuwait. Right, right. It was a, it was a war scenario situ uh, based on some, somewhat like the same situation and how the U.S. would react to it. And ironically, Schwarzkopf was part of that, train, that, that phase. Was he that. really? I think yes. he was. I'm not very yes. sure if he wasn't. But that was that was part of it, you know, how to work on in, in an environment under that, and, and I I don't remember if he was if, if he was involved in that or not, but you know I heard his name before on that, um, and then a lot of them some of them weren't surprised when we got the call up in early December, 
uh, it came on December the 3rd that we got the word that we were going to be going. What did your wife say about that? Well, it's, it's interesting because the psychological unit that was located right next door to us, um, they had gotten much the same word in September. And they just stayed there for months, you know, they, they didn't go anywhere. So on Monday, the 3rd of December, we got the call late in the evening that we were, you know, that, that we were on the earth's desk. So I told my wife, I said, well, we don't worry about it because, you know, the unit next door had had the same prop situation and they're still here. Well, two days later, we got the call that we were going. And How we much had, time did you get be f between hearing you were going to go and you found yourself on an airplane? Less than two weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was ironic because... Um, we Just were, before Christmas. Right. It, it, yeah. it happened on a Wednesday that we were told that we were going to go and then we had to report two days later. So I only had two days to get my personal affairs in order. And the day after I had to report, we were already on our way to Fort Devons. Fort Devons had us processed and out in 10 days. We, we arrived in Saudi Arabia on the 19th of December. We actually left on the 17th. We had a longer than we expected stay over in Spain and then arrived on the morning of the 19th. Tell us specifically, where did you take off from? Okay, we, left, we took off from um, Westover Air Force Base. And flew to Spain? Right. We were supposed to, to fly to Torreon Air Force Base, which is just outside of Madrid. Um, we were only supposed to stay over like about five hours, but there was a, a problem with the plane. They had to switch us to another plane, so it ended up turning into more like a 12-hour delay. And then the, the, the flight time from Spain to Saudi Arabia, being what it, what it was, we didn't arrive until just after dawn on the uh, 19th. It was Tell a Friday us, morning. Okay, they open the door of the plane. What's your first impression? Sand. Sand and, and the Kwanzaa hut type, type buildings everywhere. How about heat, humidity, whatever? What, what's it like there? Well, there was, there was heat, not so much humidity. I mean, to me it was more like to me, the whole experience was like being back in the California desert. Um, Saudi Arabia in their spring and their fall is a lot like um, being out in Arizona or the California desert. There's humidity on the coast, and I've heard it's unbearable, but I never experienced it. We were located at King Khalid Military City. Would you spell that for us, please? Um, K King Khalid, K-H-A-L-I-D. Military city. That's King Khalid. Right. Military city. Right. Okay. Um, it was named after the monarch who, who was the predecessor to King Fahd. It's it, essentially his brother. Um, it was built in the mid to late 80s. The Saudis had started building meta, uh, military cities around the periphery of their borders to guard against uh, military incursion. The the purpose of of King Khalid Military City, or KKMC as we started calling it, was to be one of those, but it was also, um, well, they had the, a, a, medic, a, a military academy there also. To, to be actually uh, as correct as I can, you are now with the 804th? No, at this point we're still, I'm still with still the 803rd. With the 803rd. It was the 803rd. Okay. Um, I didn't go to the 804th until two years after I'd come home. Okay. The, um, when we first arrived in, in, in Saudi Arabia, we were at the coast in Daman, at the military airfield there. And what was your specific assignment? Well, I'm still, at this point, it was, it was also preventive medicine. At the, at, uh, our assignment at that point was to, uh, we were going to be there for a, a couple of days until we found out we were going to go. And, um, we, you know, we pretty much knew what we were going to do. We were going to be doing the, the work of a medical group. You know, we, we had an understanding of what we were going to do. We just didn't know where or under what conditions. Um, one thing that really, it, it was funny that the things that really worked out was, um, I, I, I'm also a, uh, an avid map collector. I love, love maps. You know, that grew out of my fascination with social studies. And it's interesting because just before I went to Saudi Arabia, I had read Sandra McKay's book called The Kingdom. And she was the only female um, journalist that had been allowed to go to King Khalid Military City. So she spoke of that in the book. And I, just out of curiosity, I had done some research and I, I, I 
put it around some maps and stuff. And I had located the, the Pueblo area. And about two days after we arrived in country, um, my, uh, the operations officer with my boss came back and said, well, you know, we're supposed to go to some place called King Khalid Military City. You don't happen to know where this is, do you? I mean, they knew how I how Your I CO was, was asking you. Yeah, you know why? Because they knew that, that I was, was very good at maps, and, and I had already, um, I was the one that, that, that basically was, they relied on to do the map exercises, to put the maps together, to do, to do, to do the map training. And they asked me, he says, really, do you know where this place is? I said, sure. I just pulled a map out and I showed me precisely where it was. And um, they, they were able to, to, to figure out how we were going to get up there and you know, work out the details. And it was quite interesting um, that you know, we, uh, a couple of days later, we, we did an all-day convoy up there. And we arrived there late at night and with the set to set by tents and everything. And it was quite interesting because the first morning when we opened the tent up and looked out, it was almost like, like something from the Arabian Nights. Because at, at that time, King Khalid Military City was the central core of it was the, um, the academy. But the rest of it was there was no there was no permanent buildings, you know, for quite a stretch. Um, they had a few buildings here. They had an engineering college here. They had a, they had the um, military hospital and its adjoining buildings. But there was like large stretches of where there was no buildings. But there were roads, and you know we opened the flap of the tent and there's this huge group of buildings that looked like the, the architecture was something out of like the the uh, Arabian Nights, and. Um, at the heart of it was the, the huge mosque that they had built. You know, at the very heart of King Khalid military it had a, uh, it had a very high, had uh, a very high um, tower to it. And the call to worship at dawn, did you hear? Right, right. Yeah. That was what woke us up. The 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 Muslims, uh, what the, the Muslim call, mm -hmm. going through the area, and we heard that every morning we were there. To be very clear, you're in Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, were the wells burning in Kuwait at this time? This is um, just this is just after Christmas in um, 1990. This is before the war had even started. Mm -hmm. At this time, um, uh, Iraq had just released the Western hostages that he had held, and there was the the furious negotiations going on to try to uh, come to some sort of an agreement or or forestall any military action. Um, this also um, that was on Jimmy Carter's last day. Then is that correct? Oh no, this was this was during President Bush. I'm confused then about the hostages. Oh no, uh, this is uh, if you remember, um, there were some people, there were Western people who, particularly British, who lived and worked in Iraq. And I'm not talking about the the Iranian hostage situation. Yes, I understand. The, uh, I just if you remember correctly, I don't have a grip on these. Oh, I'm sorry. Who these hostages are? I'm sorry. Um, in I think August or September, there were uh, Westerners that that Iraq detained, and was essentially going to use as hostages to you know in case the the West attacked. Um, if you remember, there was that picture of him with that little boy, asking if he had had his cornflakes yes, or something. Yes. 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 Um, they were allowed to go the, like I think it was the same day we, we flew to Saudi or something. They were already on their way home by the time we got there. Um, and at that time, the the West was trying to find you know, the UN was trying to find some solution. They were passing all the resolutions this way and that way. And Baker and Tariq Aziz were only about two weeks away from their meeting at this time. Were you aware of uh, the extent of the buildup going up around you? Yes. Yes, we saw. How, how did you get your news? Well, we got a news from the armed forces radio. Um, I don't think there was any papers. There was. It was just armed forces radio we had access to. Um, what else? I also had a shortwave radio I had, I had bought, and I was listening to the BBC every night, so we were getting the news from you know about what was going on. Of course, at home, we had heard about all these other units that were going to go, and, and then plus when we got to Saudi Arabia, we saw all the, the units that were there, you know, because when we arrived at Daman, it was, everything else was coming in at the same time, or you, on the way in. And you did get the impression that there 
there was a good possibility of a fight. Right, right. Um, Schwarzkopf was, wasn't going to take any chances. He wanted enough people to do the job with. Uh, um, and I also saw when, I, when we first got to King Queen Military City, we, we could see the list of units that we were expecting. You know, we knew who was going to be under us and who they were supposed to be, to, to be uh, working for. Um, that we knew the medical units that were coming up. We, we basically started knowing about the other units that were coming up. Some, some of these people you knew too, didn't you? I didn't you? actually know them, but I knew no. of the units. Yeah. The only one I knew was we had a contingent from the 44th Med Brigade that was going to come up to work under us. And I knew some of the people from that group. How long were you in Saudi Arabia? Six months. From December of 1990 to mid-May mid of 1991. And what did you see? Okay, well, let's see. Um, as far as the war was concerned? Yes. Well, the only thing about the war was, the one thing that was most impressionable about the war was the scud attacks. The only thing we saw, well, the first thing we saw actually was, was the... Scud missile attacks? Right. Yes. Um, there were a few scud missile impacts in the, in the King Khalid military city area. There was one block in, uh, there's a nearby town called Hafer al Batan, about 30 miles up the road, that actually there was some buildings there that sustained a hit. We saw the, the ruins of that. There was one day when we usually got uh, we always got a uh, we usually always got a um, air raid siren at work, but one day we didn't, and it just happened that you know we that was probably the most terrifying of all because we they came right out of the blue, and we, and, and there was an explosion overhead, and you know what we were hearing was the Patriot missile taking it out, and there was like another explosion. I don't know what that was. They actually worked. Yes. Yes, it turned out Made that... Made by Raytheon, is that the... Right, yeah. right. It actually worked that, that the, um, uh, two, of my, two of the people in my section were coming back from the airfield at that time, and they were right by there. They, they saw the, the, the thing go up. They saw the missile go up, and, and they mm -hmm. watched it. But it was, it was unusual because we always got the air raids uh, were at first. But not that time. That, that time we didn't. And it was rather interesting because... Um, it was always at night, and I'll never forget one night, it was like the second or third night after the war started, when um, I was in a deep sleep, and the person next to me was trying to wake me up, and then the air raid sirens were going off, and all I could think of was I had gone through a time warp, and I was in London during the Blitz. And, I, and then, you know, once I realized where I was, was we had to put the, the gas mask on and get ready, and. You know, and then we had to wait for the all clear. But very few of there was a couple that did finally get through. But for the most part, they they didn't get through to us. The only other thing I saw about the war was once the war had, was going our way, and and the Iraqis were um, surrendering in droves, we, we started seeing a lot of the POWs. One of the things that my unit did was to help set up the POW camps. And we had to go up there and visit them and make sure that, you know, I had to make sure that the, uh, the environment, you know, that the preventive medicine mm -hmm. was being done up there. And um, I made several trips up there. It was, you know, just, we tried to do what we could. You know, we had them housed in tents and stuff, but it wasn't always the best. You know, we, they, they, we were so totally caught by surprise with the numbers of, of them that, you know, we really didn't have, for a while, we didn't have a lot of material to work with. You know, and it was, and then the weather at that time was not. It was, it was cool at night, down to about somewhere in the 30s. That's pretty chilly. Yeah. Let me ask you two questions about this particular time. The first is the the phrase is Gulf War syndrome. Um, as you know, after the war, a lot of the men and women who were over there complained of ailments that maybe are still problematical today. Uh, do you did you have any firsthand experience with this? No, we we had no inkling of that until after we came home. Um, eventually, half the people in my unit did come down with something, 
whether it be respiratory or, or skin lesions or something. But we didn't start seeing that until after we came home. Did you ever feel that you were exposed to any um, toxins, uh, any gas, any um, any weapons of extinction, as we call it? We Mass always knew that, right. We always knew that he could have, at, at any moment, unleashed biological or chemical warfare. But being in the operations center where I was, I knew he never did. The only thing that we could see that could have been say, a problem. Say that again. You you know he never did. Well, I mean, as far as we could see, he, he, there was nothing that that he was ever doing. What I'm saying is, is um, we know he never. It seemed like he never consciously unleashed anything. You know, there wasn't any toxins in the warheads that were in the scuds that we could see. Although there were some cases of the, there was a check unit in the area that supposedly picked up some form of, their instruments got a biological or a chemical reading one day. But it really didn't seem like it was, and it, like it was too much. And there didn't seem to be a, much of a cause for concern. We never received any official word about any of these things. A lot of this stuff I didn't learn until after I came home. And there was no, I mean, there did, did, did nothing seemed out of the ordinary. You know, we didn't see any animals dying or we didn't no, see that's, any... that's interesting. Let me ask you the reaction of yourself and the men around you um, as to the war ended, all these POWs, you packed up and went home eventually, but Saddam Hussein was still in power. What, what was your feeling about that? Well, we always felt that we, unlike Vietnam, we knew that we were over there for a good cause, and we just wanted to get the job done and get home. And when they made the decision to keep him in power and, and just have the, you know, try, try to, to keep him contained, a lot of us kind of felt at that time, well, the alternative was for us to, you know, we would probably have, would have had to occupy Iraq for quite a long time. And a lot of us were, at that time, we wanted to get home, you know. Mm -hmm. We really didn't think about that until years later, you know, after it was too late. Um, once the war, you know, once we pretty much had him on the ropes, we figured, well, you know, that's President Bush's decision, you know, and, and you know, we figured, there must have been a reason why he did that. And I also feel that behind that, they felt that, I really personally feel that behind that, there was um, a reluctance on the part of the Arab uh, components of the Allies, that they didn't really want Saddam so totally destroyed that there would be this power vacuum. There's always been this fear of Iran over there. And I really felt that they, they, they were afraid that if we, totally defeated Saddam and, and just, you know, pushed him aside that there would be this power vacuum that the Iranians would try to fill. There's always been this, been this fear that Iran will, will try to overrun the Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia and, and take over the Middle East, you know, in a new form of um, jihad, you know, to, to further the, uh, their secular did you hey. get an Anatola where, where, where you didn't want one? I'm sorry? You would get a, another leader in there uh, that you yes. didn't want. Well, yeah, we would, we would have um, a much stronger, um, more powerful Iran than we really wanted. Yeah, okay. Tell us about packing up and coming home. Oh, um, well, we were quite happy to be doing that because we knew we were going to go home. Um, Packing up was a lot easier than getting ready to go over. All we had to do was just put, put everything into a mill van and, and get the mill van back down to the coast because that was going to go home by ship. And the rest of us were going to be uh, going back to Deman and, and be sh shipped out by plane. We ended up flying home on a commercial airliner and made several stops. We stopped in Sicily on the way home. We also stopped in Ireland which was a, a rather in big treat for me. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Coming home. Yeah. <laughs> I have in my notes here, I think, that you have, um, is that correct, 12 medals? Right, right. A total of 12 medals by the time I retired. 
What is SWASM? That's the Southwest Asia Service Medal. Um, all of us who served over in, in, in the Saudi Arabia or the area around it mm -hmm. were, were given that. It was the um, medal that the, Ameri that, that the um, U.S. gave. The other ones were the, um, there were two Liberation of Kuwait medals. One was given by the Saudi Arabians and one was given by the, the Kuwaitis. The one from Saudi Arabia was a very impressive looking thing. It had um, this, their national symbol, and it actually had a, um, it had gold in it. Really? Yeah. I think we've brought you home now, and you were discharged in 1998, is that correct? Right. What um, did you do after you uh, left Saudi and came back? Well, uh, at that time, the Army was, was, re, was, was changing their concept of the, um, the medical, um, uh, they're trying to redo their medical department. The medical groups were going to be eventually replaced by medical brigades. And the um, 803rd knew that it was going to be going away in a few years. So what they did was, the last, from like 92 to 94, 95, the 803rd's primary responsibility was to be a, uh, a training group that would, would take the me um, other medical units and based on our experiences in Saudi Arabia, we would teach them um, elements of command and control that we knew worked from our wartime mm -hmm. experience. Um, it, 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 in two years, two years after I came home, the 804th became a medical brigade. And um, I went up, when they were reconstituted as a medical brigade, I joined them as their preventive medicine NCO, you know, and was, at that time, I got my promotion to Master Sergeant E8. So that's, you, you're in the 804th now brigade. Right. And you served with them till 98. And yeah, I did discharged. five years with them until yeah. I got, until I, um, my 20, I, I had reached my 29 years, which, which is, uh, at, when you're a, a master sergeant, if you serve 29 years, it's, it's usually expected that you get out to make room for the next person down the line. So you went all the way from recruit to master sergeant and you served 29 years for the United States of America. Right. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I think, if I haven't asked you, you, you tell me something that we haven't asked, but was the military experience good for you, and was it, uh, what did it mean for the rest of your life? Yes, it was, it, it was, it was well worth it. I, I, I never looked back with regret on it, and I am proud to have served, and for the rest of my life, I think it taught me elements of good, um, how to be a better citizen, how to be a, a, a better, um, like in my work environment, how to better deal with, with, with stress, with, with, um, with problems at work, and how to better my, my life, essentially. Yes, I, I think we both know um, the men who served in Vietnam were not well received when they came home. Um, you served the beginning of your career in Vietnam and ended it in Saudi Arabia. How do you feel when you tell people that you had such an extensive military career? Uh, how are you treated and thought of? Well, I've always been treated very highly. Um, when I tell them that I did serve during Vietnam, I always emphasize, emphasize the fact that it was stateside because um, I. I've always felt that the people who served in Vietnam never really got their due. Um, and I can't be considered his, you know, when people hear Vietnam, they say, oh, you served over there. Well, I, I never did. You know, I wasn't one of the, the, the few who did. And, and I always felt that the people who served in Vietnam um, should, should have gotten more. Including you know. your brother. Is right, that right. My brother eventually. Uh, we didn't know that there was any problems at the time, but about 10 years after he came home, he started exhibiting um, post-traumatic stress to the point where he became an alcoholic. He has recovered now, but, you know, there was a time period where he was going through a lot of problems. And it always, we always felt that the, the nation never really gave them the, the, the thanks that, that they really should have had. You know, they should have done far more for them, you know, than, 
than treating them as dishonorably as they did. You know, they, they should have been better received coming home because it really, you know, they didn't, a lot of them never really asked for that experience. Leo, is there any one thought or memory or high point in your career that you would like to share with us that I haven't asked you? Well, I'm trying to think. I think it would have to be the day I came home from Saudi. We arrived at Westover Air Force Base. We were one of three units that, that arrived, and the other two units just couldn't wait to get off the plane. We were the last ones off the plane. But we decided to do something different. We, they came off the plane, they just went and joined their families. But we decided to do something. Uh, we got to, off the plane, we got together, and we, we, we marched in, in, a, in a small formation, you know, to where the families were and then disbanded. And I'll never forget, because one of the songs that the Army Band was playing was um, um, the, so, the Bette Midwest song from, from um, Beaches, Wings, uh, uh, what's the name of it? Um, uh, wind, beneath my, wind Beneath My Wings or something. And that's always, for, for me and my little group, that's always been like our song since then. Whenever we've gotten together, uh, we've always sort of like had it played for us to remember. To remember. Know? Yeah. Leo, thank you for coming in today. We appreciate it. Thank You've you. You've been for a great me. guest. We thank you.